So uh, you've been in the situation where you know things are going grim for somebody, and they they they, they, they turn to you and they say, "Oh, when's it going to end?" Right? You've been in that situation. You understand that people have brief trouble, whatever going on. You're oh, I just wish you know. When's it going to come to an end? And that's a natural human response. Now, Mark's written for persecuted Christians in Rome. And you can just see, you know, man or grand or auntie or somebody from time to time just throwing up her arms and saying, ah, I wish it would just, you know, when's it, when's it going to end? Those persecuted Christians in Rome then have, have heard that question, they probably asked the question too. And Jesus is talking about something coming to an end. And he's talking about the end of a religious system that they've really hung on to. When things are tough and when things are difficult and we want X, Y, Z that's going on to end, we, we tend to have sort of like rocks in our life, the thing we, we hang on to and we cling to, at least that's, we know where we are with that, you know? And these Jewish guys that Jesus is dealing with, they've got the temple. And maybe three times a year they go up there and it, it's familiar. And it's, it's gone on for a long, long time. It's gone on for millennia. And it's a source of stability, I guess, and security in life. And we tend to have those. Now, it's going to be coming to an end. It's been going for millennia, but it's going to end. And that's going to shake people. Jesus is talking for a large part of this chapter about the religious system, the temple at Jerusalem, coming to an end there. And then at the end of that, he talks about the whole world coming to an end. Like everything is going to come to an end. And that's relevant. It's relevant to, to Greco-Roman people, the people who are receiving this gospel, now being persecuted by the Roman Empire because they've gone away from the old religion. They've gone away from the things that people held on to. They've gone away from either emperor worship and all that stuff, all the ancient Greek gods, if that's the world they're from. Or as Christians, they've gone, you know, to some extent, they've gone away from their temple and, and all that stuff that was going on because... They're Christians now and things have changed. Um, so the old religious systems are gone. And Jesus, in this passage, is talking to his disciples about that happening. Here's how it comes about. Yeah? Does that work? Yeah. Uh, they're leaving Jerusalem. Um, Jesus is leaving Jerusalem. And that's not incidental. As Jesus was leaving the temple, verse 1 of chapter 13 of Mark, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And Jesus says, it's coming down. It's coming down. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And the obvious question then, that the disciples then raise as, as they're sitting together quietly afterwards, the obvious question, they say, is, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite that temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things happen? What will be the sign that they will be fulfilled? Now, Jesus leaving is not incidental. Jesus walking away from the temple is God leaving the temple. Just as he's come into Jerusalem at the beginning of this part of Mark's Gospel, Jesus approaches a fig tree. And the fig tree's got no fruit on it. And Jesus curses the fig tree and you think, what's going on? And then he goes up to the temple and he clears it of the money changers and the fruitlessness of the whole system as it's come to be is evident. And when they come out, the disciples are astonished because there's the fig tree and it's withered from the roots. Now, a tree in a bush withers from the tips, doesn't it? It dies, you know, the leaves die off and it comes on back down like that. This one has been cut off at the roots, like as if God has gone, no more life fruit. You're not bearing fruit? No more life. Now Jesus is coming out of the temple and the point is made. Then he left the temple. He's gone through a process. He goes into Jerusalem as acclaimed as king. The religious authorities, the religious structures they've got at that time reject him. They try to find ways, they come at him to try and find ways to bring him down, to kill him. Doesn't work. He keeps on giving good answers, right answers. People see the good answers. Somebody then says, that was a good answer. Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And then no one dares to ask him any more questions. It says. So Jesus takes it to them. And he starts putting things back to them. And saying, look, you know, look. And at the end of that, they've got no answers. They've got no answers. 
Jesus leaves. He comes out of the court of the, of the women. He comes back down through the court of the Gentiles that he cleared. He walks out through the eastern gate. He comes down the steep little path that goes down and across the Hinnom Valley and up the other side. And there he is, sitting on the Mount of Olives at the other side in the evening sun at the end of the day, looking across. And there's Herod's temple. And it's all, we know from Josephus, it's, it's bright white shining marble in the evening sunshine. And they've gilded it and they put gold on places and whatever. All stuff that was not in God's word to do with his temple. And it's got this tremendous appearance. All these great buildings, says Jesus, not one stone is going to be left upon another. Awesome architecture. But God is gone. And he's coming back. And you can go to Jerusalem today and you can, you can look at the big stones, the scale of the stones, they weren't even part of the temple, they were the bits underneath the temple you know, they were rubble in the foundations and there's these dirty great rocks, it's awesome but when God is gone he's coming back God has abandoned it that means he will no longer defend it and however big it's rocks they're coming down time is over and you can look around you here at, in this part of the world so many places that are impressive architecturally. And if God has gone, it's coming down. And of course, we, we know what happens. Uh, Mark uses, incidentally, Mark uses two bits, he uses two errors, passive subjunctives, and I'm sure the detail thrills you. But what it means is he's emphatically saying, no way, that is coming down. That is coming down. It's very emphatic. It's very strong language. And then 70 AD, we know it did. We know from Josephus, you know, at the end of the first Jewish Roman war, uh, the temple was burned and then it was taken down, so not one stone was left upon another. Mm. Well, the obvious question the disciples have got then is when? When should we start to panic? When should that start to be a problem? Yes. Jesus starts by saying, when it's not happening. Well, it's not going to happen. When you see X, Y, Z happening, you know, not yet. We need to be very clear about this because Jesus, the context here where Jesus is talking about the temple coming down and the first half of the chapter he's talking about that sign of time when that temple comes down. Um, so really the inauguration of the new era, the Christian era you know, and the temple's coming down. It's the end of the temple, not the end of the world to start with uh, and the context is, is, uh, is dealing with that. He'll go on to speak about the end of the age, you go up from verse 32, the language changes. So he start, stops talking about those days and starts speaking about that day, the day that is coming, the language is used in Old Testament prophecy. So there's Jesus sitting opposite on the Mount of Olives, sitting up opposite the temple across the Kidron Valley, shining white marble, gold glittering decoration. When is that splendid building coming down? Here are some things that will happen before. Um, you know, we've got to be ready for those things. Uh, firstly, you'll see false messiahs. There'll be those who are coming in my name, saying, they're the one, declaring, I am he. They will deceive many, but there's only one. It's Jesus. He fits the Old Testament pattern. He's the one. What else will happen? There'll be troubling conflicts. Now, we see this from time to time. We see videos on YouTube and whatever saying, oh, that means the end of the world's coming and Iran's going to go up and Iran's having a bomb and that means, well, okay, there are all those things that go on. But Jesus is saying, you will see wars, rumours of wars. Don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But not yet. And then chaos in creation. You can go through storms and stuff like that, or earthquakes or whatever, you think it's the end of the world, you know. Uh, you think it's the end of, of, of all things secure and stable or whatever. And uh, no, no, this is just the start of it all. Jesus says, this isn't the end. This is the beginning of birth, birth pains. What you've known to be secure, the temple and all that, is coming down. It's the beginning of pains. But, <clears throat> you know what it is with these pains? When you've got pain and there's something wrong, <coughs> there's a certain feel to that. I'm told, I wouldn't know, but I'm told that when you've got pain and something good is happening, like a baby's being born, yeah, it looks like crazy, um, but you know something's good 
going to be good at the end of it. And it's like Jesus is trying to say, you're going to be shaken because that temple is going to come down. You're going to wonder what's happening. It's going to be very traumatic and all the rest of it. But actually, through this, God is bringing good things in the life of your new baby. Do you see the sort of idea that is being created around it? It's not one to panic about. It's a good thing that's happening, but it's going to hurt on the way. So how, how do you handle that? Jesus moves on next. He says, well, you look, you know, things are going to happen. You're going to panic. It's not coming, it's not coming bad. He says good stuff coming out of this. Don't worry about it. These are the precursors to birth pains. And how do you handle those? Firstly, and these are good points to take away. Firstly, verse 9. You must be on your guard. Be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils. You'll be flogged in the synagogues. Panic, panic. No, don't panic. The thing to do is to be on your guard. The second thing is to preach the gospel, verses 9 to 11. When you feel everything's shaking, everything's falling down, everything's coming apart, be on your guard, continue to do what you know to do. The Great Commission is emphasised at the end of Jesus' ministry for a point and for a purpose. When it feels like everything's just thrown up in the air, continue, be on your guard, yeah, watch out. Preach the gospel. On account of me, says Jesus, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. So remember, this gospel, Mark's gospel, is written for Rome. It's written for Rome at the time of a fiercely persecuting emperor. That experience is authentic apostolic experience. You see it in the very early chapters of Acts as well, don't you? And the reason you'll stand before governors and kings, and it's born out as the disciples were doing that in the beginning of Acts, the reason you'll stand there, not because God's abandoned you, but because he's put you there to preach the gospel to those people so that all nations are going to get to hear. All nations must hear, and here's the way. You're not to be worried. You're not to be intimidated about what you're going to say. You're not to be up all night before just working out what on it. Because the Spirit will give you what to say when you're there. And, and you read those early chapters of Acts. And what's happening with those guys? Or, or you read the three times when Paul gives his testimony. Uh, as it were. You know, he's in front of Felix. He's in front of, you know, those guys, Agrippa. He's in front of those guys. And he just gives it. And the Spirit of God gives it to him to say it. It's not pleasant, but it's ever so powerful, even reading it second hand, you know, millennia later. So you're not to be worried or intimidated with what you'll say. How you'll fulfil this great responsibility to preach Christ to, you know, this worldly, very important people. It is the Spirit of God who will conduct your diplomacy. Give you the words to say. It won't be you speaking, but the Spirit. I was in, um, I was in the cattle lines this week, um, in, in the Royal Welsh on Thursday. The cattle were there as well. I was chatting away to somebody and I could see a flurry going on at the top of the line. So, and and it, we, we knew, we kind of knew the Prime Minister was about somewhere, but there's obviously nothing much gets said. There's, a, there's not an announcement over the tower, you know, here comes the Prime Minister, because I suppose there'd be trouble. Um, but they came along and I thought, oh, what do we do now? Do we sort of get in the crowd? And, and, and no, I just kept on chatting to the guy I was chatting with. And, and he came and he went. And if he came, that'd be great. And if he wanted to talk, that'd be fine. And if he wanted to know the way to be saved, I'd be quite happy to tell him, you know. But it's in God's hands. And here's the thing we're being told. You'll be put on trial. You'll be put nearly to the test. Don't worry about what to say. Because you'll be told what to say. The other three things to do. Be on your guard. Watch, be watchful. Don't be, don't be soft-headed about this. Be sensible. Be on your guard. Secondly, preach the gospel. Thirdly, stand firm. Stand firm when it all goes up in the air and the things that you've looked at as being the things you hang on to to give you security, even the very temple and its worship. It's going to get tough. Stand firm. Not just the frustration and disappointment of, of persecution. It's betrayal and rebellion of those closest to you. Brother will betray brother to death. It's happening around the world today. 
It's happened from the earliest times. A father, his child. Children will rebel against their parents, have them put to death. Every woman will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Standing firm will be saved. Were you in that? I don't know, we went through the healing somewhere quickly the other day, in the farm meeting somewhere. I don't know if you were there, but, but you're looking at what Ephesians does, and it, it gives you sort of the gospel, what God's done, to put Jews and Gentiles both right with God and bring them together again. So the eternal plan and purpose of God in Ephesians 1, and then as we look there, is um, to bring all things together again under the headship of Christ. So as we come under Christ's lordship, do you know, God mends again in his broken world. So that's the big priority. And then it says, it, it, that's the sort of doctrinal part. And then the practical bit is this. Therefore, because that's the eternal plan and purpose of God, and that's how he's done it, work for unity, work for purity, and work for standing fast in the spiritual conflict. And here it comes up again in, in the ministry of, of Jesus. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Persevere. Still the beginning. We're still dealing with the downfall of Judaism, the consequence of her temple being left by her God because it wasn't fruit for God. So, that's when it's not happening and how to handle it. Verses 14 to 27, when it is happening. There are suffering signs of the end and there are cosmic signs of the end of the world. So verses 14 to 23, there are these, these three things said about those suffering signs of the end. The abomination that causes desolation. Roman idols were brought into the temple before it was destroyed. So the Holy of Holies was desecrated by these guys who were coming to tear it down before they tore it down. And then when you see that happen, flee. Just, just don't take anything with you. It's like leaving a burning building. Leave it behind. Run. It'll be awful if it happens in winter. Nursing mothers, oh, it'll be hard on you know, the vulnerable. Just, just get out. Flee. Um, and then there'll be days of distress. Distress, unequal. Well, there was this terrible conflict before that, that fall of, of, of that temple. And then there are these things happening in the heavens. Cosmic signs of the end. Heavenly bodies being doing strange things. Isaiah 13 prophesies about this. The rising sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. Um, and, and we know that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, we know the sun was dark and it was before this happened, you see. Um, we know the sun went out and the moon doesn't give its light. Do you know, Isaiah 13 says that's going to happen in a passage about the fall of Babylon. It's about the fall of Babylon. With all its corrupted religious systems and, 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 and it, it, it's, its corruption, its, its inequalities, its injustice. And then Isaiah 34 says all the stars in the sky will be dissolved and the heavens rolled up. And, and, and that is from a passage about the judgment of the nations. It's like Jesus is touching buttons. Talking about the temple, but its worship has become so corrupt and fruitless for God. Say, you know, I'm using a passage about the fall of Babylon, about the fall of the temple. That is a potent thing to do. That's really controversial. It's going to kick off. He's using a passage again about the judgment of the nations, and that's in the context of God leaving the temple, abandoning the edifice of temple worship at, at the heart of Old Testament uh, uh, Judaism. And so we see those things happening even before. The, uh, the, the temple comes down, the siege of Jerusalem. What, how are we to handle that? There's an allusion again to the fig tree, which again is kicking off what Jesus has been doing in that parable, saying no fruit will cut you off of the shoots. Temple's destroyed eventually in AD 70. Roman army, future emperor Titus is leading it, and uh, they besiege and they conquer the city of Jerusalem. It's been occupied by uh, Jewish rebels in 66 AD, the rebels against Roman rule, and the, the siege ends up with the sacking of the city, destruction of that tremendous, tremendous town, it must have been quite an effort to knock it down, I don't know how they did it, and 
then you can you can you can see it's there, and uh, you can go to Rome and you can see the Arch of Titus, which celebrates the knocking down of the, the, the conquest of the, the victory there, AD seven, the destruction of the temple. And as Jesus is saying that, he says, you know, it seems unlikely, boys. It seems unlikely now at the time, but my word is being given to you. My word will not pass away. It'll happen. And we've got the archaeology to show that it did. How do you handle that? Current time awareness. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender, and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And we know those disciples who are sitting there, quietly around Jesus, looking across the Kidron Valley, looking at the shining temple in the evening sunlight, they will see these things. They will not go. They will not leave this world until they have seen the vindication of God against those who have taken his sovereignty from him, set up their own religious system in its place, and God has departed. So, then we get to verse 32. Because nothing's happened in this context yet to show us that Jesus is explaining anything other than the destruction of Jewish worship in the temple. Uh, and, and God has promised these things and Jesus assures them by the eternity of his word, which is which is not part of temporal creation, it's, it exists outside time just as he does. But in that portion of that eternal word we're reading here, something's about to radically change. Because with verse 32, the time reference changes really, really radically. And, and that day or hour, comes into consideration. It's been those days up until now, but now it's that day. And we, we, we do all these things as Christians conscious that they will come that day. That day. Um, I sometimes feel we don't make enough, I don't make enough, let's put it like that, of the future in my considerations of the present. So we're going through our lives now and our lives now are really, really shaped by our past and what's happened to us in the past and where we've been in the past, what we've thought, what we've done. That's a big influence on us. Ideally, and th probably this is the way it should be, what happens when a person becomes a Christian is that the past we've had becomes less of a dominating feature in our lives. It doesn't go away, you know, that would be wrong. It doesn't go away, but it becomes less of a feature compared to mm. the future that God's now got prepared for his people. And it's easy not to make enough of that, isn't it? doing what we're doing now, not because it's necessarily very pleasurable and enjoyable, Jesus has been talking about all that, but because we're going somewhere, this is what's going to be, and we're living for that. And with verse 32, that time reference changes radically, and that day or hour now comes into consideration. Not those days, but now that day. About that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard. Be alert. You don't know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task. And he tells the one at the door, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back. In the evening, midnight, when the cock crows at dawn, he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. But I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And with all these difficult things that Jesus has been saying, guys, you know, I'm not going to lie to you, it's going to be like this. You're going to have to deal with, with this and yon and us. With all those things that are going on, it's like, keep that point on the battlements. Keep that appointment when you're looking forward to see that Jesus is coming, that it's going to make sense of a lot of stuff that's rubbish now, and keep your eyes on that future aim and goal and what you're moving towards, so that when things that we, we look at as being secure and stable and reliable, even like the temple, are shaken, we're still looking forwards. When persecution and suffering and difficulty comes, we're ready to say, uh, it's time for 
preach the gospel. Be alert to what is actually happening in this situation. Because we understand the times, we understand the progress, we understand our transit through this world towards that which is future and that is coming. And we're dominated in our thinking by the magnetic attraction of the future. Which conditions our living by. Does that make sense to you? That is about the hardest chapter possibly in the New Testament. But certainly in the Gospels try to do is track a line through it as to what it's dealing with in the context where it's going and what Jesus is trying to do is just to point his people forward and say keep looking out for the future that's coming not the disturbing present or the past that's been but to be dominated by that attractive vision of where we're going immediately where he's going is, is Calvary shaking, it's going to be really devastating those disciples are going to be shaken to the core but Jesus has already pointed them beyond that and beyond the sufferings and the difficulties of Acts and beyond the trouble that's going to be caused towards the future that God's prepared 